This is dark, and it is heavy. In all my storytellings, I have never censored my script. I won't start here, so. Listener discretion is strongly advised. It's the only warning you'll get. Let's get something established before we even begin. The backdrop of a very certain character. They might be called God, Death, Devil, Crow, Friend, Fiend. They're all true and incorrect because this thing is a liar and a cheat. Calling it the Queen of Maggots is fair enough, if that's how she wishes to present herself. They say don't make deals with the devil, but what if you're not given any choice? What if your ability to decide is taken from you? Your hand is forced. You must take certain actions. You cannot fight back. Your worst dreams are made real because of this. You live in a waking nightmare. But to acknowledge that something is not your fault, yet it is still your responsibility, can be a powerful realization. In this trilogy called The Devil Came Through Here, which of our characters comes to understand this? Well, should you choose to play, that's very dependent on you and your choices. So I guess I should ask, will you come to understand this? We'll start out of sequence in the trilogy, but at the beginning. Let's meet our first character, Susan Ashworth, who lives at 12 Helen Road in London, England. When our Susan, the cat lady, was young, her life was quite different from when we met her at the start of the game. She was married, a new mother, a young woman in a stunning red dress. The fine details of her early life are decided by you, but really don't have any consequences to the overall story design. So we will start with one very prominent night in Susan's life. In her striking red dress and pulled back hair, while alone with her baby daughter in an apartment, Susan receives a phone call. An admirer who sends Susan flowers every Friday night when he knows that Susan's husband is at work. You see, Susan is in a tired, loveless marriage with a man named Eric. She willingly receives each set of flowers and takes each of his phone calls. How she acts on this particular night is up to you, but this is a ritual that has taken place for quite some time, and that cannot be ignored. And when husband Eric arrives home, we get more insight into the dynamic of this love triangle. It's just another Friday night, another bouquet of flowers, Another phone call from the admirer. Susan puts the flowers into baby Zoe's room before husband Eric comes home. Eric is a cab driver, and this evening he was close to a terrorist attack, a car bombing, which caused him to get into a wreck, totaling his cab and disrupting future income. When he arrives home that night, he absolutely tears into his wife. He tried to call after his cab was totaled, but she didn't pick up. The terrorist attack frightened him, but she didn't even know that it happened. The apartment is a mess, but she chose to take care of baby Zoe instead of clean. He was hungry and wanted dinner, but she fed Zoe instead of making dinner. He wanted attention too, but she was too busy playing and changing diapers. He had to slave away at work, while she lazed about at home. Of course, this was a massive fight, one of many we can safely assume. But while they fight, Baby Zoe slowly chokes to death in her room. She has a rare allergic reaction to the flowers Susan hid away in her room. While her parents argue on and on, baby Zoe is suffocated. Her chokes and coughs drowned out amidst the yelling and fighting. A few days later, Eric disappeared into the woods. He was found not long after, dead. He drank himself to death alone in the wilds. Susan is now a widow as well, completely alone. When we meet Susan, many years later, she has not overcome this trauma and pain. She is depressed, beyond the point of functioning. She has not engaged with the world in many years. She's hidden away in her apartment with only her cats and her memories. We meet Susan after she is committed to suicide. A bottle of pills down the gullet. It's only a matter of time before she slips away. The one goodbye she makes is to her cat, Teacup. In the space between life and true death, we meet her, the Queen of Maggots, as she calls herself, a fitting name for a liar, snake, cheat, and victimizer. The Queen of Maggots is different from person to person, but visually represents the same, a decrepit old woman who will gaslight the vulnerable into submission. 
and that in between, the queen tells Susan that if she complies, if she does the bidding of the queen, she will restore Susan's life and happiness. All it will cost is murder, five murders, but it's okay, because Susan will be murdering five very bad people called parasites, and it's hard not to cheer Susan on as she is pulled into this and begins her spree to accomplish this. She's given immortality. She develops a kick-ass attitude of no mercy. But with each situation she is pulled into, Susan is exposed to violence and horror at the hands of another. And in turn, Susan inflicts violence on these parasites. This? This is her healing process. The parasites land at her feet. They're presented to her after extreme ordeals that generally involve Susan being tortured or murdered and then brought back to life. She's butchered by a doctor, her eyes burned out with bleach, threatened with rape and cannibalism, forced to kill herself to escape complete helplessness, bound and beat in her own home. She watches other innocent people be harmed because of this. This is the process that the Queen of Maggots chose for her. But Susan can make choices. She's not helpless. Not as helpless as she thought herself to be. Or she can choose to remain a victim of circumstances. That's between you and Susan. Well, and Mitzi. A friend Susan makes after her suicide attempt. A friend who actually saved her from that suicide by breaking into her home and calling for an ambulance. A really cool chick who carries her own trauma and pain. Mitzi has cancer. It's terminal. Mitzi has known of her pending death for a while now. She only has maybe six months left when we meet her. When Mitzi was initially diagnosed, it drove her beloved partner Jack to lose parts of his sanity. They'd been together since they were children. They'd become lovers when they reached adulthood. For Jack to lose Mitzi was unthinkable. Jack began to interact with online forums about grief and death. There, he met a user named Eye of Adam. Eye of Adam was a suicide preacher. They advocate suicide to others who are suffering, when life becomes too much for them to bear. Eye of Adam convinced Jack to concoct a plan so both Mitzi and Jack could die together happily. So Jack did design a plan, where they could die together, joint suicide, so they would never be apart. But Mitzi didn't want this, and Mitzi didn't know that Jack had been in contact with this Eye of Adam. She wanted him to live. She wanted to continue to fight, but Jack's senses never returned. He prepared for suicide and begged her to join him. He gave her a place to find him and a deadline. When Mitzi arrived, it was too late to stop him. Her Jack was dead. She was alone. She found out about the Eye of Adam and vowed revenge before she passed. She tracks him down to Susan's apartment complex, Mitzi arrived at Susan's door that fateful night of suicide to inquire about a room to rent. It was quite the coincidence that she arrived just in time to save her life. Mitzi and Susan live together for a time. Mitzi tells her about the Eye of Adam and Jack, but withholds that she does not wish to just talk to them. Mitzi's true intentions of revenge are kept secret. When we do reach that climax, revealing Eye of Adam to be the final parasite, it's here that the consequences of Susan's choices come into play. It's here that you must decide where Susan's heart has fallen. Because lives can be saved if you've chosen wisely. If you acted with care, there's also room for rebellion as well as vengeance. Susan can rebuild and carry on, if given the chance. Susan can prove herself to be quite the badass fighter, but it's up to you to determine if that will be her fate, or will sorrow and heartache be her future? Is the Queen of Maggots your ally, or will you rebel? We move now to a different story within the game Downfall. It's the story of Joe and Ivy Davis. These two lovebirds met when they were children, in fact. A fateful day involving Joe's little brother, a crate of hand grenades, and Darwinism. But from the very beginning, we know that something is not right with Ivy. As a girl, she sits outside a diner alone, waiting for her mother to come out. Her mother is eating. Ivy is not. Ivy is on a diet. Ivy does not want to eat. 
We don't meet Ivy's mother, who dines without her, but we can safely assume that there is abuse and neglect taking place. The consequences of this will be carried within Ivy all the rest of her life. When Joe and Ivy meet again later in life, they become a couple and eventually marry. Joe is not equipped to help Ivy with her mental health, though he insists on doing so. Rather than acknowledge that there is a deep problem within his wife and finding help for her, he acts as though he is her caretaker and problem solver, as though him talking to his wife will be enough to fix her. Ivy will starve herself for extended periods, then engage in cycles of binging and purging. She tells Joe of this. It's no secret. Joe's response is to discourage the behavior and praise her when she eats. But over the years, their marriage begins to crumble. Ivy's perception of herself is in ruins, and she is almost completely detached from reality. Joe decides that they need to take a vacation together to an Oceanside Inn where they can work on Ivy's behavior and patch up their marriage. They depart from their home at 12 Helen Road in London, England, and travel to Quiet Haven Hotel for a retreat. Ivy disappears in the night, and when Joe begins his search for her, things within the hotel become otherworldly and horrible. The manageress, a seductive and taunting figure within the story, tells Joe to stop bothering with Ivy, that she's a lost cause and not worth the effort, but Joe refuses to give up on his search. He discovers that Ivy is being kept away from him within a mirror and only by killing four aspects of a being called Sophie can he free her. The first aspect that Joe meets is a tiny, sad version of Sophie, who begs for Joe to kill her in a merciful and peaceful way. Joe obliges. With each encounter with a new aspect of Sophie, Joe's method of murder becomes more destructive. He blows one up, force feeds a concoction of flesh and poison to another, and takes a chainsaw to the last. It gets easier with each dispatch. He becomes more sadistic. Joe meets Agnes within the hotel, a quick-witted and smart-mouthed do-gooder who aids Joe in his search for Ivy and the four aspects of Sophie. All along, Agnes offers him support but hates the destruction being brought by Joe. She will avert her eyes, question if things are really necessary, and have words with Joe when he speaks inappropriately. The four aspects of Sophie and Agnes, well, they're all a part of Ivy. Agnes is her happiness and quick wit, the smiling bride that Joe remembers. When confronted by the Queen of Maggots, Agnes rejects her cynicism in every way and refuses to participate in her games. The four aspects of Sophie are Ivy's delusions, self-loathing, suicidal thoughts, her isolation, and her depression. Here's where things begin to break down. You see, Joe and Ivy Davis never really leave 12 Helen Road. Joe and Ivy are, in fact, the neighbors of Susan Ashworth, the cat lady. This all takes place on the grounds of the apartment complex. When Joe destroys the four aspects of Sophie, he is in a way killing parts of Ivy. He's doing it to save her, to deliver her from the destructive parts of herself, but he's killing parts of her. He's killing parts of his wife. He's destroying her. He thinks he's helping, but he is not. He even ends Agnes, the good memories of his wife. It's supposedly a sacrifice Agnes makes to help Ivy, but Agnes isn't real. Agnes represents something within Ivy, and Joe kills Agnes to save Ivy, but fails in the end. Ivy is already dead. Perhaps her death is what spurred on this entire psychotic break from reality Joe is experiencing, and he's forced to acknowledge it after completing his self-created tasks of killing aspects of Sophie. He sacrifices Agnes as well, in an attempt to bring Ivy back to life, but of course, it fails. And then, Susan shows up. She strolls through Joe and Ivy's apartment after hearing a ruckus late into the night. The door is wide open. She's the fearless cat lady, after all. These sorts of things are her specialty. Inside, she finds plates of rotten food, furniture chained down, holes in the floor down to the lower level, dozens of mannequins, and torture devices. Susan says, Someone's screaming. Great. 
That can only mean one thing. Joe's lost the plot. Joe is her sixth parasite. The Queen of Maggots herself shows up to taunt Joe with this information, though he refuses to acknowledge it. Susan has had quite enough of Joe's behavior, so now we ask, has Joe really been killing aspects of Sophie this whole time? Hmm. Susan arms herself and hunts for Joe. She mercilessly strikes him down and finds Ivy's corpse after having been pumped full of electricity after Joe's attempt to revive her. However, Joe is able to beat Susan back and steal Ivy's corpse away, fleeing with it after the building is set on fire. Authorities arrive to address the fire and find several corpses in the building, bodies that were dead before the fire broke out. A witness spotted Joe, carrying a charred body to his car, but Joe escaped with Ivy's corpse, leaving his fate unknown. Now we go to the finale of the trilogy. We meet a girl named Lorelai. At a young age, Lorelai lost her father to cancer, and this broke her heart. Lorelai did her best to pick up the pieces of her life, but her mother, Miranda, could not. Miranda remarried a man named John, an alcoholic and racist scumlord with perverted tendencies towards his stepdaughter. Lorelai spends her teenage years in this environment. Miranda became pregnant when Lorelai was in her final year of school. This new child brought more strain into the household as babies are expensive and cry and need attention. Lorelai loved her little sister Bethany and dreamed of stealing her away for a better life together, away from their home in London, perhaps in New York City. Lorelai got work at an elderly care facility rather than pursuing college. She gave up her social connections to peers and friends. She accepted a hard and isolating life to try and make a better path forward for herself and baby Bethany. But her world imploded within a day of starting that new job. A resident told her that she would die that night, something Lorelai brushed off. But at home that night, it all went to hell. Her stepfather came home from drinking late, instigating another major fight with Miranda and sexually harassing Lorelai. Miranda and Lorelai fought when Lorelai confronted her about the treatment of baby Bethany. Late into the evening, Lorelai found her mother had locked herself in the bathroom and was not responding. With her stepfather passed out on the couch, Lorelai snuck over to her neighbor's apartment and begged for help and for no police to be called, out of fear that Bethany would be taken away. Her neighbor, a young man named Zach, is a solid guy and has feelings for Lorelai. He jumps at the chance to help her. When they finally get into the bathroom, they find Miranda hanging from the shower rod, long dead. Stepfather John enters the bathroom and mocks Miranda's corpse. Even in death, he won't leave her any peace. It seems to be quite funny to John. Lorelai is enraged by this, screaming at him. The affair ends when Lorelai is murdered at the hands of John and Zack beaten on the ground. Lorelai enters the place in between life and death that is unique yet a place we've seen before when Susan Ashworth attempted to end her life. And here we meet that familiar face, the representation and instigator of everything that brings an individual torment, the Queen of Maggots. The Queen informs Lorelai of the danger Bethany and Zack are in. Her stepfather will kill them, but the Queen of Maggots can return Lorelai to life to save Zack and Bethany, yet time and time again, her stepfather overpowers her and kills her. With each return to the in-between world where the queen resides, Lorelai is pressured more and more to give herself over to the whims of the queen and to serve her. But what happens here is different. While Joe refused to acknowledge his actions and thus served the queen's wishes, and Susan complied only to rebel in the end, Lorelai is defiant from the beginning, which reveals a peculiar weakness within the Queen of Maggots. She needs people to do things for her. She cannot kill on her own. She cannot influence beyond her in-between realm. She needs Lorelai to do it for her. 
Lorelai is restored to life over and over, but has the choice to comply with or ignore the will of the queen. Even in situations where there does not seem to be a choice, Lorelai finds a way to make her own path. No matter how enraged the queen becomes at her, she can't actually hurt her in any way. Lorelai meets another character in the in-between place, a being called Jimmy the Traveler, who goes to the realm of the Queen of Maggots in his sleep. Jimmy fears the queen and wants to kill her. Lorelai is free to make her own choices along the way. And after every trauma and painful event, we find that our Lorelai rises up, brushes herself off, remembers her purpose, and carries on through it. It's because of this strong spirit and unwillingness to surrender to what's being done to her that Lorelai succeeds in the end. The embodiment of every negative spirit possible, the being called the Queen of Maggots, cannot claim Lorelai. Lorelai saves Zack and Bethany from her stepfather. She wins, but that does not mean she has a happy ending because the real world can't be beaten. She gets a new start with Zack and Bethany, but the looming threat of reality is still there. Potential troubles between her and Zack, uncertain prospects for the future, haunting memories of the past. She's lost her mother and her father. The fight for their futures isn't over. The real world is calling for her attention, and no other worldly abilities will help her in that fight. I'll leave this trilogy with the parting words of Susan Ashworth. I've forgiven the world, and myself too. I teach myself to smile again. One day, I'll get there, I know I will. Even if it takes me not nine, but nine hundred lives. <laughs>